Good morning. You're welcome to OTB AM. We start this morning with an appeal. Have you seen our friend and colleague, Owen Sheehan? Last seen at around about six o'clock yesterday evening outside Fitzgerald Stadium in Killarney, laughing in the face of a Cork supporter. Since then, unfortunately, details of Owen's whereabouts are sketchy. From what we understand here on OTB AM, an emergency meeting of the Kerry Football Yarra Council was held last night. In attendance at this meeting, which was called by their honorary chairman, Tomas O'Shea, were Mark O'Shea, Darrell O'Shea, Pat Spillane, Don He, and of course our very own, Owen Sheehan. What does a meeting like that involve? Well, from what I can gather, they were addressed by Peter Keane, who said, lads, it's time for peak Yarra. So what we can expect over the coming days from the O'Shea's, from Sheehan, from Spillane, is peak Yera. It'll start slowly. It'll probably start this morning with, at Cork were no great shakes. Ah, they didn't really bring their best stuff. But over the coming weeks, you can expect them to really up the ante. Mark O'Shea will be on the last word with Matt Cooper, and he'll be saying, Jeez, Matt, I think Clifford's a little bit off at one point in a Munster final. Not really, not really what we'd expect from him. Maybe the hype's getting to him. Don't think Kerry can win an All-Ireland with Clifford in this sort of form. You can expect that coming your way from Mark O'Shea. We'll have Pat Spillane cutting across Cora Staunton again and again and again on the Sunday game. Saying Kerry are still a team in transition. Sure, defensively, they're a shambles. And worst of all, over the coming days, you can expect Owen Sheehan to come on OTB AM when we eventually find him and move Kerry down the power rankings. They're not going to number one. They're going below Mayo to number three. So if you see Owen Sheehan this morning, and I'd say the Boar's Head area of Dublin is probably your best bet to have a look around. Tell him, Owen, this is a safe space for you. You are a friend. You are a colleague. You are welcome back. This is a safe space for Yerraism. Owen, come home. We miss you. We love you. We want you and your Yerraism back soon. All right, so... That is a very somber way to start, O to be AM. No Owen Sheehan, no Jerry Gilroy, but Tommy Rooney is here. Good morning, Tommy. Nathan Murphy, good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I I, I watched back the Kerry Cork game last night because I was in Crow Park for Mayo Galway. Congratulations. Mayo have now won 48 Connacht titles. Another Connacht title? Some of these yeah. lads, some of these lads, they don't even know how many Connacht medals they won. But James Horne is one sixth manager, which is pretty impressive. Um, but I'll tell you what, I, I was just f finishing up in Crow Park. I was chatting to Michael Meehan and, and the WhatsApp messages were coming through. I hadn't had a chance to flick on the Kerry Cork game and didn't look good. Did not look good for Kerry. And I know Cork had a good start for 10 minutes. I hope I'm not breaking privilege here, but I have a WhatsApp message from Owen Sheehan at half time saying, Jesus, lads, that was tense. <clears throat> At half time, saying, Jesus, lads, that was tense. Can you imagine how the Mayo people felt at half time? They're five points down to go away. The go away fans were loud. Mayo were rattled. And they came yeah, out my text awesome messages at half time, half. my messages at half time include the, the F word, many of them. But hey, Mayo, somebody started a little scrap. Somebody riled up Aidan O'Shea. And hey, the rest is history. Mayo back in an All Ireland semi final. What longevity this group have put together. 10 All-Ireland semi-finals in 11 years. Dub supporters, don't you at me. I don't care what happened after that right now. I am just pointing out that this group, for some of them, are playing in a 10th All-Ireland semi-final in 11 years and standing in the way of another All-Ireland final. Dublin, or the other team to have beaten them in recent years, Kildare. Mm -hmm. So Gilroy's yeah. off preparing for the Leinster final. So, uh, yeah, it was a, a cracking weekend, yet again, of sport. If uh, There was a lot of guilt, considering how brilliant the weather was, uh, of sitting inside and watching uh, this. But I'm sure a lot of people are getting into the Olympics. The news overnight, brilliant news. Mona McSharry is through to the final in the swimming. The first Irish swimmer in 25 years since <clears throat> you-know-who uh, to get to a Olympic final. It's an incredible achievement for Mona McSharry. It's been a mixed night overall. Uh, there was a lot of disappointment for the boxers, including Michaela Walsh, very early this morning. I will be chatting about that as well. The Lions won. First test has gone mm -hmm. to the Lions, which was uh, massive as well. And obviously, 
Well, what about imagine being a Galway person this morning, Tommy? Imagine like it's bad enough at the best of times, but imagine <sighs> being a Galway person this morning. Knocked out of everything. The, like and to be fair to them, they put on an outrageous comeback in the hurling against Waterford. But how on earth did they let it slip so far? There were 16 points behind at one stage in that game. They brought it back to one. They're out of the hurling. They're out of the football. Like for poor Joyce, Nathan, it looked so good at times in that game. But we have to say, Mayo's gamesmanship, they've learned from the best. I know oh. you're on holidays last week, but I spent a good portion of airtime last week talking about how Dublin... The only way they could beat Mead was a little bit of gamesmanship in the second half. And we saw what they Tommy, 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 they cut three, you off on the football three, pod with Paddy and Andy, rightly so. They cut you off because you were talking nonsense. Three incidents in the Galway Mayo game yesterday. As Michael Meehan said, were they clumsy or were they coincidence? Now, I don't know. Clumsy. I don't know, but three Galway players had to, well, two Galway players had to go off. And the star man, Shane Walsh, who was absolutely sensational in the first half, had to get an injection in his shoulder at halftime because he was slammed to the ground by a Mayo player. It's None senior of the football, it. Tommy. What do, what do you want to do? They'd already and literally listen. given him a pat to goal, which he had taken advantage of. Do you want him to do it again and again and again? No, you got to lay down a marker. No, I, no, I do understand that. I do understand that. But look, I think it has to be said, though, Mayo have to be commended for their gamesmanship because we commend Dublin for doing it, for, for towing over the line. And getting by, that's, you know, Owen and Jerry uh, were saying last week, 100%. Look, we're going to get into Galway in the performance rankings, we're going to get into a bit of Kerry. And if that's from the Olympics, the, the boxers were unlucky again on, overnight. We had two more defeats in the boxing. Um, Michaela uh -huh. Walsh lost. The, the Olympics, uh, it's been mixed for the Irish so far. And uh, have you watched much of it? Uh, not a whole pile, to be honest, because I've been on the road a bit over the last couple of days. But I'm going to get into it properly now this week. It is a, it's a brilliant thing on a Saturday, Sunday morning when you find yourself mm. watching an hour and a half of uh, skateboarding, making its uh, Olympics debut. One guy in the skateboarding had a full Phil Bab in right. the post. Oh, no. I mean, at full speed. It was horrific. Absolutely horrific. Now, there's been quite a few weird things happening at the Olympics. One of them yesterday was in the women's road race, uh, in the yes. cycling which was won by Anna Kaisenhofer, Austrian, rank outsider. Uh, hasn't had a professional contract in four years. Nobody expected her to do anything. And she broke away early, and she won by about 50 seconds and thought, wow, what a, what a surprise uh, that this rank outsider has won the cycling event. And then the next group, which contained most of the favorites, came through into their finish. And Annemiek van Vluten, one of the hot favorites, crosses the line to win her silver medal and has the arms outstretched in full celebration in a way that you're thinking, it's great to win an Olympic silver medal. is a massive achievement, but I would have thought, considering she was one of the favourites, that maybe to be a tinge of disappointment, you wouldn't be celebrating like you've just won the race. And it turned out, unfortunately, that Van Vluten thought she had won the race. Didn't realise that the Austrian cyclist had been part of an early breakaway that came back, but she didn't come back. And there's no radios, no team radios in Olympic cycling. So most of these riders are used to the longer events where your team will tell you there's a four-person breakaway and mm. here's the gap. They didn't know that. So when they caught the breakaway group, for some reason, some of those within that following group didn't realize that Anna Kleisenhofer hadn't come back as well and basically was able to just cycle off and win. Now, <laughs> Anna Kleisenhofer is a math student, it seems, a PhD in math, and this was part of her game plan, apparently, was to go oh. early, that she had figured out that actually one of the best ways of going in the searing heat over in Japan uh, yeah. was to try this, and it worked out. But there is some, well, heartbreaking footage of Van Vluten as she finds out that Poor Van she didn't actually win gold. And while she's doing some of her post-race interviews, other competitors are congratulating on her winning gold because they didn't realize either that oh my Clyde Hoffer had stormed out in front. Uh, so that was interesting yesterday morning. These are things you just stumble upon now at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's going to take over your life for the next couple of weeks. Uh, last night then, the men's triathlon was on. It started about half 10. It's so hot, they had to start at half 6 in the morning over in Tokyo because they're in what once you get into daytime hours well into the 30s uh, mm. so they're lined up for the start of the men's triathlon and the buzzer goes but there's a boat right in front of half the triathletes 
So half of them dive into Stark. The other half are there. Well, there's a boat which is carrying the cameramen. They have to stop. Two or three of them dive in nearly under the boat, which has massive propellers and engine at the back of it. And uh, yeah, they have a false start. The rest of them only went about 150 meters. I'm not sure what impact it had on the That overall must have an impact, though. Result. That, co that must completely throw you. Oh, well, even then, when they got the race on the way, the guy who was driving this boat was right on top, getting as close as you possibly can to them to get the best camera. And I'm like, get the hell out of the way. Yeah. Uh, so they're kind of a couple of the quirkier moments from the Olympics so far. But uh, yeah, ah, it's sitting down watching the volleyball for a couple of hours, mm. a bit of basketball, the French beating the USA Yeah. Uh, yesterday. There's been a lot going on. And obviously, uh, I was say mixed for the Irish uh, so far, but um, the fact that Mona sherry has got through to the final is uh, a heck of an achievement. So we're going to be talking a lot more about all of that. OTB AM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. So here's what we have coming up over the next little while. Tommy is with us for the performance rankings. What will be in the red? What will be in the orange? What will be in the green? Where will the green and red fit into all of that as well? Uh, so that's coming up in just a moment. Paddy Andrews is going to be with us as well to reflect on those big wins for Mayo and Kerry yesterday. Maybe give us a bit of insight into how the dubs are feeling ahead of Sunday's Leinster football final. At half past eight, we will hear from our own Ronan Mullen, who's been up pretty much all night watching the Irish boxers in action at the Olympics and give us his thoughts. And what's been a disappointing start for the Irish boxers so far. Sarah Donovan with us then at 8.45. At the draw for the quarterfinals of the hurling championship, Dublin and Tipperary in there now as well uh, for those quarterfinals draw with Waterford and Cork. That's happened about half eight. So Sarah will join us just after that to look back on the weekend's qualifiers and also the latest in the Camogie Championship. Phil Egan with us just after nine o'clock. He'll run through everything that has happened in the Olympics overnight. And then Alan Quinlan reflecting on that first test win for the Lions. Warren Gatland, it turns out, is an absolute genius. So... Uh, the papers to come from half nine as well. Do get in touch, as always, on all our social channels here on OTBM. But right now, it is time to get into Monday's performance rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. The performances was just lacked that intensity. So every Monday morning on OTBM, we give you the chance to win a Gillette starter pack. All you have to do is tell us who should make the cut for our Gillette performance ranking. Send in your suggestions on Twitter, Instagram, or comment wherever you're watching. We will pick a winner a little bit later on in the show. So with old Sheehan missing in action, Tommy Rooney is stepping into the breach for this week's performance rankings. What's going to be in the red? What's going to be in the orange? What is going to be in the green? Tommy. Well, Nathan, you stole my thunder at the top of the show because we're starting with the red and we've got the Kerry Mafia up front. Now, the Kerry Mafia is an all-encompassing phrase. It captures Owen Sheehan's WhatsApp group with all of his mates from Kerry where they wind each other up every week and they get each other, you know, all ready and all on the same page about what they're going to say. And it also includes, as you mentioned, Tomas O'Shea, Pat Spillane, Dar O'Shea, Mark O'Shea, Owen Sheehan and any other Kerry voice in the media that's out there. Now, they've had a good run of it for the last couple of weeks. Do you know? They had plenty to talk about with Dublin. Asher Cluxon's coming back or he's not coming back. Or Cluxon's going to be one to crack the dubs. And I'll be honest with you, sitting in Crow Park with Paddy Andrews last week, he refused to read Tomás O'Shea's column. He knew what the Kerry boys were at. He knew what they were doing. They were starting. And all week we had to listen to Owen Sheehan say, Cork are going to give us a good run of it. Cork are going to make it a close game. In our quick picks on Friday, I'm fairly sure Owen had it a two or three point win for Kerry I went for ten and I got laughed out of it everyone else had believed it Will and Adrian went closer to two or three as well so look at all week long it was going perfectly for them they talked Cork down sure didn't Mark Keane beat us on his own last week or last year do you know what Nathan the only provincial final that wasn't in Crow Park the Munster final Peter Keane had his eyes on Cork and only Cork they were giving them the respect they deserved and I think we've got a tweet here from 20 past four Jojo, you might be able to throw it up. Owen Sheehan, at 20 past four, 20 minutes into the game. Sure, Kerry people were being disingenuous by calling an arrow in, weren't they? Cork are a brilliant team. What happens between the first water break and the next water break? Over the next 40 minutes, at that stage, Cork led by six points. Over the next 40 minutes, Kerry outscored them by 22 points, 
Four eleven to just one point. This was the ultimate Yera. And it's possibly, quite possibly, the yet last Yera that any Kerry person can make for the rest of the year. Because they are the form team in the championship. Make no mistake about it, the dubs are rattled. I saw it with my own eyes. I watched it last week. I watched a mead man shoulder a dub for the first time in 10 years. I watched turn after turnover after turnover in the third quarter of that game as Mead outscored Dublin by one six to two points. The last team to do that to Dublin, Nathan, Mayo in 2015 in the All-Ireland semi-final when they were seven points down and they came back. Dublin aren't Dublin anymore. And Kerry are coming. Forget about David Clifford not scoring a point yesterday. It doesn't matter. Paul Ganey's going to score two goals. Sean O'Shea is going to stand up. Paddy Clifford is there. Another Clifford, man of the match yesterday. So Kerry are here and Kerry are here to stay. Do you know, how many All-Irelands are going to win in a row, Ker- or Nathan? What are you saying at this stage? Are you saying three? Are you saying four? Because at this stage, they're going to get by Monaghan Tyrone. A Tyrone team that they put six goals by six weeks ago and a Monaghan team that they have never, ever beaten in the championship. And after watching Mayo four times this year, I'm backing your boys in the All-Ireland semi-final. And then I think Kerry is going to break their hearts in the all Ireland final. That's the way it's going to go. You're backing Mayo to beat Dublin. No, I'm not. I'm just saying that for the for this morning. I'm saying that, but there is a chance for, for effect. For effect, you see, for I, effect, I, I, there, I, is, there I, is going to be a game. I, there, I'd you go know? along with the errorism in that. I think never has a team been as talked up while achieving so little as this current Kerry group. Mm. Go and do it. Come back to me when you've won an All Ireland, and mm. also the disrespect for this great Dublin side, out of everybody. Everybody, they still like me. Never looked like beating them. You landed a shoulder on them. You need to land more than a shoulder. You're talking about 2015 for the first time since Mayo since 2015. Don't look on the All Ireland in 2015. Doesn't matter how you win All Ireland. You don't need to win every All Ireland by 15 points to no, prove that true. you should split Dublin. Dublin win the All Ireland by a point. It's still seven All Irelands in a row. It's still one of the greatest achievements there's ever been. So I don't understand this talking down of Dublin from everybody at all. They're just buying That's their time. Mayo men can't Jarrah. No, we, 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 but listen, by the time it comes to the All-Ireland semi-final, I will be predicting a Mayo win. Don't you worry, Tommy. Yeah, and we're look, the anti-era. Uh, we'll, we'll get into Mayo in a couple of minutes' time and we'll be talking to Paddy Andrews about it as well. But um, look, it remains to be seen whether Owen Sheehan will, will move the dial enough to put Kerry into first place. There's a serious amount of pressure on him. Can you imagine the amount of pressure of a whole county, and a county like Kerry? I can't even remember what Paddy called them, but Owen Sheehan could be calling them the same thing if he manages to put them into first place. Because they'll all turn on him. They really will. Um, and I don't know whether it's the right thing or not to put them into first place, but they've been absolutely unbelievable so far this year. They've been absolutely exceptional. Do you know? They've destroyed Galway. They've destroyed Tyrone. They scored 118 on Dublin. <sighs> they absolutely destroyed Cork. Like, what did Mayo beat Leitrim by? Was it 24 points? Like, they bet Cork by 22 points yesterday. That should not be happening. Shouldn't be happening in a provincial final. But it's not a shock, is it? I, it I, I didn't think it was I, that much of a shock. Now, you know, the Heat may have played a, a part. You know, Cork obviously had a brilliant start. But Kerry's firepower is just something else. And I think the way Peter Keane has them set up, they learned their lessons from last year. And they're an awesome unit this year. I was being a little bit disingenuous there about Dublin at the start. I was getting a bit excited. You're right. But Nathan, they have lost 80 All-Ireland medals in the last 18 months. And... About 20, 20 odd of them have gone in the last, about 30 have gone in the last four weeks with Keen O'Sullivan, Kevin McMinnon going to Tokyo, Cluxton not returning, and Eric Lowndes walking out of the panel. So they're under pressure, but as, as Andy Moran and Paddy Andrews said last week, if John Small and Owen Murch comes back, it's a different story. I don't know if Killian O'Connor is going to be back from Mayo. I asked James Horn, and he looked at me with, you know, as if I had two heads, um, as if I didn't understand what a ruptured Achilles was. So maybe there's no chance in hell that Killian O'Connor is going to be back. But um, yeah. Will we get on to the next county? Or the oh, next let's, let's give as much time for this one as possible, Tommy. County Galway are in the red. What a horrendous weekend for Galway. Just brutal. Do you know, there were strong favourites against Waterford. There was, it was five or six points was, was the odds going into this game, was the handicap going into the game. Waterford had nearly been put out by Leash last week. I know that Clare were actually hoping to get Galway because, you know, they, they knew what was coming with Cork. Um... And they just they just weren't good enough. Like Joe, they have Joe Canning there. Thank God Joe won his All Ireland a couple of years ago because you know he's he's getting towards the end now and uh, he's after overtaking Shefflin in the, the all time scoring charts. And I'm not sure like we're going to play a bit of James Gale later on talking about retirements. It's hard to know whether Joe Canning has another two or three years left on him. He may have one more year. 
Um, and then in the football... He's nearly 33. He's nearly 33, Joe Canning, just on that, because it was interesting. Skell was saying there'll be... Well, there'll be a big fallout from that Galway hurling defeat, and there'll be retirements, and maybe Joe will start wondering about his own position. He's 33 soon. Mm. And then Ollie was on the Sky coverage saying something similar, not sure how much longer that Joe's going to be around for, which gives a sense that maybe conversations have been going on in the background. I don't know. It's yeah. going to be very hard for Joe Canning to walk away. I know he was he bided his time in coming into Intercounty Hurling and did it on his own terms, and maybe he'll go mm-hmm. out on his own terms as well. But when you're of that importance, it's not as if there is a conveyor belt of talent coming in behind him ready to step in, that there'll be enormous pressure on him to keep going for as long as he can. But that what is a disaster. Whatever about the final result and the comeback yeah. and forwards last club, to find yourself 16 points down. Yeah. There's bizarre. got to be a fallout from that. Yeah, it was, a, it was a bizarre performance and a bizarre result, we'll say. And we, we'll wait and see who Dublin and Tipperary pick up in the All-Ireland quarterfinals. But I'd imagine they don't want to face Cork. And like that water for Dean Wilder was a great performance. To let that 16-point lead nearly slip was quite alarming as well. So look, for Galway, a terrible weekend. If Joe Cannon goals, it's going to be even worse. But in the football, Nathan, like, the, the, it was a brilliant game of football. Now, I've had the pleasure of going to a couple of games this year, but this was the first match I've been at that was really properly competitive, that we knew was going to be a good game going into it. We got about 15 minutes of meeting Dublin, and that was it. We got about 10 minutes in Clare Mayo, and, and that, that was all we really got of being competitive in the in the league semi-final. But in this game, right from the first second, before the ball was thrown in, Padre Gohora was smashing Rob Finnerty's shoulders in the corner of the pitch. Sean Kelly was in the throw in on Aidan O'Shea. Immediately you were looking and scanning to see who was picking up Shane Walsh, where was Paddy Durkin, who was picking up Comer, where was Lee Keegan. You knew the matchups were going to matter. And for the first 35 minutes of this game, 40 minutes, we'll say, with, with the injury time in the first half, it was an absolute battle. And Galway were on top. They really were. Like, that goal in the first half, the first goal, never mind the second one, but the first goal, when Paul Connery hits that ball, Shane Walsh is 40 yards from goal. How on earth is he the first man to react? It's absolutely ridiculous how that ball just fell to him. Now, we saw Jeremy O'Connor in the second half uh, try a volley as the ball dropped to him. As the ball was falling to Shane Walsh, I was thinking, don't shoot. Hit it. Don't, don't, don't hit it. Because if anyone was able to do it like that, and I had Michael Meehan sitting beside me who had scored a goal from the ground from a free beforehand from that distance, you were just thinking that if anyone could do it, Walsh could do it. But he picked it up and he absolutely buried it by Henley. Five minutes later, He'd taken on three Mayo defenders on the sideline. It was slightly reminiscent of Daniel Flynn's run for Kildare against Dublin a couple of years ago. I don't know if you remember that, where he bombed down the side of the Hogan, cut inside and put a ball over the outside of his right boot. Walsh cuts cuts in, beats O'Shea, beats Keegan. There's another Mayo defender there that I can't remember. He may have taken steps, lays on a platter for Damien Comer. Bang! Mayo were six points down. They didn't score in that second quarter until the 32nd minute that Darren McHale scored a point. Now, I was quite perplexed before the game. I was convinced that James Horne would be making changes to his starting 15. I wasn't convinced that Jim O'Connor would have the legs to start, and I thought he might have found a way to get Owen McLaughlin in there. He brings on McLaughlin, Owen McLaughlin and Kevin McLaughlin at halftime. It just gives him the legs. Galway lost Sean Kelly after an innocuous clash, maybe a minute or two before he, he pulled his hamstring, and Rob Finnerty, one of their um, sharpest scorers, a male son, we'll say, in the first half as well, after an innocuous clash with Padre Gohora as he ran across the square. And also, after Shane Walsh set up that goal, and you can see the replay in the background, it's Lee Keegan who slams him to the ground when he's running by him. So Walsh had to get a, sh- a shoulder injection at half time. Now, Lee Keegan is one of the best man markers in the game. I've seen Paul Flynn come on in an All Ireland semi final. I can't remember if it was an All Ireland final or All Ireland semi final. At half time, Mayo, he couldn't get to the pace of the game. He came on, and Keegan is rifling him shoulders and hitting him boxes the second he comes in. Flynn just couldn't get to the pace of the game. So when you're going up against Lee Keegan and you skin him once, you're not going to skin him again. And that's what happened to Shane Walsh in that game. Was it, was it, was was it not Potter Gohora who nailed him? Nailed Walsh in the, in the, in the first half? No, it was Lee Keegan. Mm. Okay. It was Lee Keegan who was standing to the ground. So, well, unless my, my Zoom capabilities on the on the video replay was wrong, but it looked like Lee Keegan. So, if I've missed that... Wild, I've missed, wild accusations that to Lee Keegan. against one of Mayo's greatest ever people. A man pushing for the Mayo Mount Rushmore. But listen, do you want to throw around those wild accusations no. here? You were in Crow Park. What was the good word? What happened in the tunnel? Because, again, talking about the good people of Mayo, outrageous accusation by Joanne Cantwell that Mayo, mm. back in Crow Park, second consecutive game, does a scrap in the tunnel. 
Not that, you know, you can put the two of them together. Listen, the dubs were up to something dirty. We know that in the All-Ireland final last year. God knows what the Galway players were trying this time. What happened? Having a clue. I asked James Horn about it. Um, he obviously didn't tell me. He said he, he didn't see it. Again. <laughs> Gave me the look again as if I had two heads, as I said. Um, but Aidan O'Shea, something must have been said to Aidan O'Shea. Something must have been said. Because Aidan O'Shea came out a different man in that second half. And I actually, I actually watched the game back last night. When you watch it back, you can really see the impact that O'Shea had because it's hard to see it when you're trying to follow a game and take notes and stuff like that. But O'Shea had a, a serious amount of turnovers. But he was playing so deep in that first half. So deep. He, he had a brilliant turnover in Shane Walsh at one stage. Sent Tommy Conroy away. Conroy should have taken his point. Tried to make a goal and got done for over carrying. Just before half time, I'm sure you remember it, O'Shea feels that a huge ball inside in the square. He gets bottled up, free out. Start of the second half, bang, ball into O'Shea. He feels it, flicks it, to, I think, to Paddy Durkin. Fouled, penalty, game on. And Mayo le- never lost control after that. So O'Shea's role, going in and out, defining the balance right. I think he needs to be kind of moved in and out. So look, at that's that's kind of where we're at with that. I'm going to move on to the Olympics very quickly because we only have a couple of minutes left here. Um, and I, I've put Irish Olympians in the orange. And, you know, we were talking about the, the great achievement of Mona McSherry earlier on today. But just to start off, first off, to become an Olympian, to go to the Olympics is obviously a huge achievement. So you've obviously won to get there. But to lose so early is just heartbreaking. So for the likes of Jack Woolley, for Emmett Brennan, for Brendan Irvine and Michaela Walsh this morning, like to get there, it's huge. And just, you know, I, I know the likes of Irvine and, and Emma Brennan, there were, were underdogs going into their fights. In these games, when you, you can't have the crack of the Olympic Village, when there's a pandemic going on and, and you're, you're not getting to taste the full atmosphere and all of that, it just must be even worse. Do you know, it, I just I just feel for them that, you know, you're over there now and they're probably going to have to go home in the next day or two. And yeah. I can't like imagine it is a reminder the atmosphere. That like, there is no tomorrow for these athletes mm. when it comes to an Olympics, on the main Olympic sports. It's why as brilliant as it would be to see Shane Lowry, Rory McIlroy, or Leona Maguire, or Stephanie Meadow win a medal. Like, yeah. It's not the be-all and end-all of their season even, never mind their entire career. Whereas mm. Jack Woolley now has to wait four years and think about that fight again and again and again and go through it in his head and wait for another opportunity and hope to Christ he doesn't get injured over the next four years or something doesn't go wrong. Yeah. And likewise with Emma Brennan and yeah. the emotion in their interviews of, I, I think as well of not having their family and friends there and having to go back probably to a hotel room by themselves and not have that embrace of, mm. you know, somebody quickly to say, you know, we are proud of you. Like you have achieved a hell of a lot to even get to this stage. But as you say, to be there in this incredibly just sanitized situation, not allowed really any interaction outside of team Ireland. And he's like, for for someone like Jack Woolley, while he wouldn't want to admit it, and he would wanted to have, you know, he knew his Olympics was going to be over after the first weekend, pretty much either way, because yeah. of the way the Taekwondo was set up. Yeah, he would have had two weeks having a very, very good time at the mm. Olympic Village. Instead, they have to get out of Tokyo within forty eight hours, back home to Dublin, and now he's going to spend yeah. the next two weeks sitting watching it. So it it is devastating for for those athletes, and it listen, it's been a, a mixed mixed start. And, and look, you'll be talking about Emma Brennan's story with Ronan a little later and, you know, Kelly Harrington is still to fight and we, we have Kurt Walker who won, obviously, um, the only Irish boxer to win so far. But like Brennan's story, that's somebody who took out a loan, who had his family backing him over the last four years. He nearly left the sport, but he got to the Olympics. Like it's, he, he, He's an Irish Olympian. So you, you'll hear a bit more from Ronan about that. Congrats to Reese McLennan, who's con- uh, made it through to the Pommel Horse final, um, the first Irish gymnast to do so. And obviously, Mona McSherry, the 20-year-old Sligo native like she shaved, was it 0.3 seconds? Oh, sorry, she was 0.3 seconds short of her personal best. Like a sensational performance. She's turned up and she's in the final. It's tomorrow morning, 3.15 a.m. Set the alarms and get up and watch it. We'll have reaction live on OTBM tomorrow morning. But like that is a massive final. As you said, the first time an Irish swimmer has been in an Olympics final since 1996. <clears throat> uh, just when you think things can't get any worse for Tokyo, there's a typhoon on the way yeah. as well. So the rowing has been pushed back for a couple of days. Yeah, uh, the, and we've had some good performances it, it, in the rowing so far. And Annalise Murphy's uh, in action as well again. So, Well, Annalise, I think, is hoping for the typhoon because Annalise uh, performs far better the windier it is. And it's been incredibly okay. flat calm for the first couple of days, which is why she probably had a slow start yesterday. So Annalise wants 
uh, the wind to blow and but not to blow strong enough that it's uh, called off. As you said, Monomax Sherry, 3.15. People are just figuring out the timings around the Olympics. So mm. if you're up around 8 o'clock, you'll still get a good five, six hours in of Olympic goodness. And actually tonight, I mentioned the men's triathlon. Tonight at half 10, Carolyn Hayes is in the women's triathlon. I uh, interviewed her a couple of weeks ago incredibly likable i'll put it up online you should watch it you will want her to do well she's been in bracken form as well and that's on tonight at half 10 so you can actually stay up and it'll be over by about midnight so uh that is well worth watching into the green tommy you've left yourself at barely any time to just praise yeah, the brilliance of mayo little time, but we, we've been talking mayo already so first real test of 2021 passed they needed that you know they've put 20 points up in every game so far they've like they scored a minimum of 20 points they've Hammered Leitrim, they've hammered Sligo, they breezed through the Division 2 campaign. We didn't really know what Tommy Conroy and Ryan O'Donoghue were made of. Conroy didn't have a great first half, but he was awesome in the second half. I don't know whether James Horne, you know, riled him in a half time or, or whatever he said to him, but Conroy was exceptional in the second half. Ryan O'Donoghue had a really good game. Um, Oshie Mullen was awesome as, al as always. Padraig O'Hara stood up, so hopefully, I think it's a rib injury that he got. Um, hopefully he's fine. So, a good first quarter. A crap second quarter, a sensational third quarter, and a really impressive fourth quarter as well. So Mayo, James Horn, sixth Mayo title, congratulations. You're on to the All-Ireland semi-final against either Dublin or Kildare, so we'll see what happens. Number one. Now, obviously, I could have put in any of the Olympic stories. I could have put in the Lions. I know you're going to be talking about it with, with Alan Quinlan a little later after they won the first test against South Africa. I uh, could have put in Cork, Hurling, but... You know, with the football, I, I kind of decided to leave off the county of Cork altogether. Paul McShane is number one in green. What a right. remarkable story this is, right? <laughs> McShane has been re-signed by Manchester United. You know, he, he came through uh, as a... As, as a player, prospect. should we point it out? Not as a player, as coach, he's been re-signed. as a player Not as well. Coach. He's been re-signed by Manchester United as a player. So I think it's 16, 17 years since he's had a Manchester United jersey on. He never played first team game for the club he was sent out and loan a couple of times and he obviously moved on he probably moved on in and around his Ireland debut where he marked yeah was it Jan Collar that day and against Czech Republic in his, in his first game mm. for Ireland um so McShane is back at Manchester United so they've re-signed him as a I say a player coach to to work with the under 23s so he's going to be working with bringing through under, uh, younger players there's a extremely talented under 23 group there in Manchester United and he's going to be playing alongside them He's going to be coaching them. So he's clearly a very highly regarded coach. He's done his badges. It's fantastic to see. It's massive. Um, so he's clearly highly regarded in coaching circles of Manchester United bringing him back. And also just to note that Brian Barry Murphy, Nathan, you've spoken to this man a couple of times in the show, the, the son of a Cork legend, Rochdale manager, but they've released him from his contract. They've agreed to let him go because Manchester City have hired him now as the lead coach of City's development squad. So that's two unbelievable moves for two former Irish footballers. So Manchester United fans, forget about the fact that Paul Pogba and Mina Raiola are him and hawing about staying or whether they're going to go or not. Maka is back. Ripping his heart out. Ripping his heart out to be back at Manchester United. I'm delighted for Brian Barry Murphy as well. As you mentioned, he was on the show about a month ago. And funny enough, he had Gavin Bazunu, obviously, at Rochdale last year on loan from Manchester City. And it's had a few City players. So they obviously trusted him. And even talking to him that night, you could tell he was probably better suited to that sort of role than maybe actual management while he okay. found himself as Rochdale manager. He, you could tell he loved the player development side of it. He loved working with young players. He got enormous satisfaction from seeing players actually improve. Whereas I think he found difficult that the results-based business that they're in, Rochdale were relegated last season, uh, that you know he can point out and say, well, we have progressed this way, this way, and this way, and if, if you're losing matches, nobody really cares. So it's a big, big job, and Manchester City take the development incredibly seriously because while not many of them go on to play for Manchester City, they do love mm -hmm. to sell these players for 10, 15, 20 million euro. So they need to get that job right, and as you say, for Paul McShane as well. And a lot of our... Uh, former players involved in key roles at underage level. Gary Dicker's just got the exact same job at Brighton with their academy, which is an incredibly highly rated academy as well. So hopefully at some stage we see these coaches come back into the Irish underage system as well. But that is Tommy Rooney's performance rankings. We don't need Sheehan back, Tommy. You can stay. You can stay. That okay. was a uh, top quality Thank stuff. You. And listen, you put Mayo in the green, which is the key thing. Mm. Uh, but we want your shouts as well uh, for the performance rankings. We want you to let us know uh, what 
the performance ranking should be uh, just to get in touch on any of our social channels and we will announce the winner live on the show at half past nine. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. So, an absolutely packed show still to come on OTBM. There's lines with Alan Quinlan after 9 o'clock. We bring you the latest from the Olympics. Boxing with Ronan Mullen and hurling with Sarah O'Donovan. But we're back right after these. So, in Gaelic football with Paddy Andrews.